We have, in the past, investigated the still unexplained, now lost, stonewalling technique, now commonly referred to as polygonal masonry. We have described the incredible feat that this technique involved, the mystery of how an ancient civilization once cut and perfectly fitted together these enormous jigsaw puzzles, sometimes comprised of megalithic blocks weighing many tons in weight. However, we have also covered the coalescence of this polygonal technique with another, which has become known as Cyclopea within Italy, with the Cyclopean walls built upon those by those who possess the ability to create polygonal masonry. All but proving that this Cyclopean technique predated that of seemingly more competent polygonal technique. But just how old these techniques are, or indeed the age of these structures themselves, is now lost to history. However, our next area of interest may shed some light on these sites' considerable age, if you consider the evidence that the site itself presents. Known as the Pelasgic Wall, it is located upon a gigantic, once leveled natural rock within the Acropolis of Athens. The wall, during the time of Thucydides, was claimed to have stood several meters high and six meters broad. It surrounded the entirety of the ruin, with a large visible fragment of the original wall, demonstrating this claimed scale still standing and located upon the southern side, close to the original entrance. Yet today, the beveling can be seen, but the wall has all but vanished, with the foundation of the wall laying below several feet of natural sediment buildup, indicative of a tremendous age. Said to have been built by the Pelagians, hence the name given to the wall. Not only does the sediment present at the site suggest a far more tremendous age, but the sheer size of the structure, along with the rock it now sits upon that was entirely leveled at some point within ancient antiquity, all points to an ancient feat far beyond the capability of known ancient Grecians, and just like that of polygonal masonry, predictably can be seen at sites just like that of polygonal, which are often surrounded by controversy when it comes to the claim construction and origin of said sites. We logically conclude that these attributions to different groups within known history, easily identified in other locations where these groups never ventured, is solid proof that those who state such false truths know they are indeed being deceptive. It is a ruin which we find highly compelling. We have in the past covered the astonishing ancient high technology still present within the gas-filled lens of Nineveh. Along with this proof of an ancient civilization's knowledge of glass-blowing and convex lens-making, there is seemingly many more examples that have quietly been found, studied, and pushed into the archives of museums worldwide. In particular, those found within the ancient sites upon Crete. Although many a sleuth has discovered this fact, and have subsequently investigated these claims, and indeed proofs, of an ancient civilization's astute awareness and past ability at creating these perplexing reading lenses, lenses of a surprisingly high quality. The first exposure of this truth came from a most unlikely of sources, that being the July issue of the British Journal of Physiological Optics in 1930, which contained a communication from a Mr. H. L. Taylor in, quote, The origin and development of lenses in ancient times, which ascribes the development of the lenses to the Cretans of 1800 BC. His examination of the museums of the Eastern Mediterranean has led him to the conclusion that ivory and steatite, the materials used for beads prior to 2000 BC, later replaced with rock crystals, onyx, agate, and cornelian. The discovery of the magnification produced by a bead of rock crystal, he believes, led to the production of lens-shaped beads and eventually of lenses such as those of the Royal Gaming Board found in the palace at Knossos, the best of which now rest within the archives of the Museum Candia within Crete. Their magnification ability has been recorded at between 5 and 8 diopters and are plano-convex in shape. 
These quality lenses were then transported out of the area to the mainland, including Troy, Tyre, Nineveh, and the United Kingdom." End quote. However, any explanation as to how these ancient artifacts were indeed created remains unknown, or indeed untold. The closest anyone dare tread is claiming they are of natural rock crystal origins and developed accidentally. Regardless, their existence is undeniably highly compelling. There is a literal smorgasbord of smoking-gun ancient architectural anomalies which dot the Peruvian hillsides literally thousands of miles of ruins. With ancient trails stretching far into South America and much farther afield, the largest known ancient artifact ever found is, in fact, a trail just like this. Yet the structures they built still stand as a testament to their creator's abilities, which were indicative of an ancient civilization with abilities and knowledge that mainstream academia seems hellbent in its reluctance to even consider the possibility of their existence. It refuses to even discuss the topic, regardless of the fact that these buildings were made by people who were members of advanced ancient civilizations that somehow became lost within history possibly during a near-extinction-level event. Yet I digress. Our reason for the digression is an intriguing, if limited, post we came across recently, discussing one of the most remarkable, if little-mentioned additions to the most miraculous factors of the ancient Peruvian architecture, most notably its polygonal masonry, which has allowed it to be earthquake-proof for untold ages. It's keying stones, featured in the article, allowing these ruins to just brush off earthquakes, such as the 7.7 on the Richter scale quake that hit Peru in 1950. As mentioned, it was a curious article, and the reason for our fascination and surprise in its existence was the institution responsible for its printing. It would seem in a brazen move just casually covered advanced technology, i.e. keying stones, the institution in question was Cambridge University. Coined as mechanical keying, the article does indeed begin with explaining the stone's miraculous placement and thus their ability to brush off natural disasters, yet predictably just drifts off into another subject without ever attempting to answer the obvious. That being, if these locations were built by the civilizations in which academia, and we should say especially Cambridge agrees, were a primitive people with a primitive knowledge of stone architecture and primitive tools, how did they not only create these keying stones, but the seemingly perfectly cut stones which make up the famous polygonal stonework of ancient Peru? Not to mention the multi-layered megalithic fortress of Sacsayhuaman, clearly created by those who built Machu Picchu, but the enormity of the stones they used, and the possible reason for this, seems too deliberate for it to not have been indicative of some warning. Yet regardless, of each side in particular, their keying stones are a remarkable legacy of a lost civilization, one which we find incredibly compelling. We have in the past covered the fascinating fossilized footprints of apparent ancient giants that may have once roamed our Earth. These prints, undoubtedly of a tremendous age, a timeline and existence which flies in the face of current teachings. Along with these giant prints, we have also touched upon the baffling, seemingly melted handprints found upon stones within Wyoming. Yet one area of fossilized prints which have seemingly slipped through our radar until they were recently brought to our attention, is the vast array of extremely ancient human-sized prints found throughout the world. In this segment, we will specifically focus upon those found within St. Louis, firstly due to their remarkable nature, but also due to a curious letter received by a fellow of similar interests recorded by William R. Corliss in his source book, Volume Strange Artifacts, sent in 1837 by an English geologist. It read as follows, quote, Lest I should again neglect to call your attention to a subject to which I have long since intended to claim your particular regard, I will in this brief space allude to it. In the fifth volume of your journal, 1822, 
There are remarks on the prints of human feet observed in the secondary limestone of the Valley of the Mississippi by Mr. Schoolcraft and Mr. Benton, with a plate representing the impressions of two feet. Ever since my researches on ripple sandstones, published in Jameson's Edinburgh Journal, I felt persuaded the prints alluded to were the genuine impressions of human feet, made in the limestone when wet. I cannot go on with the arguments that may be urged in proof of my opinion, but rely upon it. Those prints are certain evidence that man existed at the epoch of the deposition of that limestone, as the birds that lived when the new red sandstone was formed. Get all the evidence on this head you can, rely upon its most important results will be its consequence." He continued, His fellow friend Sir Woodbine Parrish, who was seemingly an English knight of the realm, was familiar with other prints. Quotes, Tells me of similar impressions which have been seen in South America, and there was a dispute among the top Catholic sects as to whether they were the prints of the apostles themselves." End quote. These mountains of accounts and actual physical proofs that man may be very much older than currently argued, we not only found seemingly overwhelming, but certain individuals' denial of such highly compelling. When it comes to the work that we do, and the vast selection in which there is regarding historical mysteries, we will often seek out the more obscure, the easily missed, often overlooked items, which to this day remain enigmas. We hope that by categorizing the many bizarre, and if not for our republishing of said curiosities, we feel lost history, like so many areas of antiquity which have inevitably been forgotten. One of which is known as plumagery. It is a practice so rarely discussed it does not even appear in many English dictionaries, yet possesses such an interesting historical connection with an equally compelling accompanying explanation for said connection, makes its obscurity not of a surprise, yet they are indeed undeniable. Plumagery is the practice of weaving bird feathers into many different forms of tribal attire. Firstly, I will quote Academia's explanation for the similarly found within this rare practice found upon artifacts discovered or excavated all over the Pacific Rim. This is to display the level of contortion Academia must undergo to allow such area of history to fit in with their timeline of events, most in particular, the separation of the continents themselves, evolution history and chronology in regards to human migration to make all aforementioned hypotheses match up and ties up with a neat bow never to be questioned again. On page 49 of Archaeological Anomalies, Small Artifacts, Bone Stole, Metal Artifacts, High Technology, Corliss makes a general observation which we feel conceals a truth unchallengeable. Quote, the art of weaving wild bird feathers into gaudy garments and adornments was practiced widely in pre-Columbian Asia, Oceania, and South and Mesoamerica. He continues with this phrase, quote, Plumagery techniques were so much alike all around the Pacific Rim that diffusion is a distinct possibility, end quote. Distinct of a word descriptive used to describe a method of identifying something or someone. For example, if plumagery of the exact same artistic construction were to be found on a continent it simply should not be upon, regardless, its characteristics making distinctly identifiable as the work of the same, thus made by people in contact with each other. This scenario to the befuddlement of those who study mainstream opinion is a real-world reality. Therefore, their own method, if identifying whether the people who made these garments in a specific way had been in contact with each other, has simply compromised their own dating methods and turns history they thought they had learned so true could maybe have a few gaps used against themselves, with the word diffusion meaning contact and sharing of knowledge and commodities. Plumagery. 
one more piece of a puzzle we find highly compelling.